Excuse me, little dog. <laughs> you know what? I have like 40 pots. Hi, guys. It is a spectacularly gorgeous day. I mean, over the top beautiful. Actually feels like a spring day in spring. Imagine that here in paradise. We're at Sister Sandy's house somewhere in the somewhere in the hinterlands of upstate New York. <laughs> and uh, so I left Austin, Texas on Tuesday. I was in New York, baby, on Wednesday. It is now Thursday. And May 12th, because it's Friday the 13th tomorrow. So I'm just now getting around to all the doom and gloom. I have not had a peek into the doom and gloom. No. All week. And but I've talked worry. your ear off about everything but else. Except doom. That's right. So anyway, but I can always trust my alert leaders. Now I was going to read this thing from my lieutenant, Tom, in Vermont. This book-length manuscript from the Guardian called the carbon bombs set to trigger catastrophic climate okay. breakdown. <laughs> Nothing like so this is <laughs> the uh, the upshot of this article is oil and gas majors are planning scores of vast projects that threaten to shatter the one and a half C climate goal. Yes. If governments do not act, these firms will continue to cash in as the world burns. There you go. Uh, anyway, guys, uh, this is a book-length manuscript that would take about two hours to read. Um... Uh, Anyway, just one quote from uh, our friend Mr. Guterres from the United Nations. Quote, <coughs> simply put, they, meaning the oil companies, are lying and the results will be catastrophic. Investing in new fossil fuels infrastructure is moral and economic madness. And uh, anyway, I might come back to this. Uh, Please don't. <laughs> but I'm telling you, this is uh, good Lord. Uh, it's more than I can swallow. So I'm too chicken to dive into uh, to that morass. So, but right here, you got all. You know, I was just bragging on Time Magazine last week. Right here. Uh, Time Magazine, I guess, is pretty much devoting their whole issue. The, the cover of uh, this week's Time Magazine, The Cold Truth, Lessons from the Melting Poles. And uh, Time Magazine sounding more and more like Environmental Coffee House. So uh, Sandy and Jennifer don't need to go digging deep. All they got to do is look at the cover of Time Magazine. On Sunday. Uh, so maybe they'll be talking about that on Sunday on Environmental Coffee House. We will. Uh, how Time Magazine has now joined the Doomosphere, but yeah. <clears throat> I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Sandy and Jennifer cover the uh, oh, story you. about the polls. <clears throat> but I guess okay. it was from inside this issue we have none other than my old buddy uh, and fellow collapsitarian Vaclav Smil, S-M-I-L. Now, back when I was interviewing Vaclav, he uh, very uh, diplomatically declined to be interviewed by uh, Collapse Chronicles for whatever reason. He is uh, lost. Yes. So anyway, Vaclav did not feel like talking, but uh, <coughs> we're just going to let Vaclav Smeal in Time Magazine, anyone uh, trying to draw some dots between that first story that I mentioned about carbon bombs, let Collapsitarian Vaclav Smeal connects some dots between The Guardian and Time Magazine. 
Take it away, Vaclav. <clears throat> the modern world cannot exist without these four ingredients, and they all require fossil fuels. Yes, the four foundations of global industrial civilization, 100% dependent on fossil fuels, and we wonder why there are 165 carbon bombs getting ready to blow. All right. <clears throat> Take it away, Vaklov. Modern societies would be impossible without mass-scale production of many man-made materials. We could have an affluent civilization that provides plenty of food, material comforts, and access to good education and health care without any microplastics or personal computers. We had one until the 1970s, and we managed until the 1970s, I mean to the 1990s, to expand economies, build requisite infrastructure, and connect the world by jetliners without any smartphones or social media. Yes, we did. But we could not enjoy our quality of life without the provision of many materials required to embody the myriad of our inventions. Okay, four materials, four materials rank the highest on the scale of necessity. There you go, forming what I have called the four pillars of modern civilization. Cannabis? Yeah, right. Uh, cannabis, that's nowhere. Okay, what do you think the four pillars of modern civilization are? I don't know if, if he's going from four to one or one to four. But anyway, cement, steel, plastics, and if you listen to my rant, you should guess this one, ammonia. Ammonia being one of the four pillars of modern civilization are all needed in larger quantities than our other essential inputs. The world now produces annually about four and a half billion tons of cement, 1.8 billion tons of steel, nearly 400 million tons of plastics, and 180 million tons of ammonia. Ah, but it is ammonia that deserves the top position as our most important material. How many people on the planet would, uh, would agree with Vaclav Smeal that ammonia is the number one pillar of modern civilization. Ammonia's synthesis is the basis of all nitrogen fertilizers and without their applications it would be impossible to feed at current levels nearly half of today's nearly 8 billion people. There you go, we're not going to get into the uh, the old uh, sustainable organic farming going to save, going to feed a planet of eight billion people ain't going to happen. We're not even feeding, uh, what does he say, you know, to really feed people. Uh, we, we can't even cover half of it. Uh, anyway, we'll get back to ammonia here in a minute. <clears throat> The dependence is even higher in the world's most populous country, feeding three out of five Chinese, three out of five Chinese people depends on the synthesis of this one compound. So 60 per, as he's saying that 60% of China would starve without ammonia. Jesus. This depends this dependence easily justifies 
calling ammonia synthesis the most momentous technical advance in history. Other inventions provide our comforts, convenience, or wealth, or prolong our lives, but without the synthesis of ammonia, we could not ensure the very survival of billions of people alive today and yet to be born. And of course, uh, what this has to do with anything is that ammonia is a product of fossil fuels. Without fossil fuels, we have no ammonia. You get off fossil fuels, billions of people starve to death. Really? Jeez. Oh my God. There you go. Sorry, so now, I... let's look at plastics. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is in the order because he started with ammonia, so maybe he's going down the list. Okay. Plastics are a large group of synthetic organic materials whose common quality is that they can be molded into desired shapes such as this computer, these glasses, this camera, the tripod, this chair, uh, Sancho's collar, this table, I'm pretty sure this fence, and maybe the house. <clears throat> they can be molded into desired shapes, and they are now everywhere. As I type this, the keys of my Dell laptop or my HP laptop and a wireless mouse under my right palm are made of acrylonitrile butadine styrene. I sit on a swivel chair upholstered in a polyester fabric and its nylon wheels rest on a polycarbonate carpet protection mat that covers a polyester carpet. But plastics are now most indispensable in healthcare in general and in hospitals in particular. Life now begins in many maternity wards and ends in intensive care units surrounded by plastic items made f above all from different kinds of PVC, which is polyvinyl chloride, such as this picket fence around the porch here. <clears throat> PVC, so this is just a few of uh, the medical uses of PVC. Flexible tubing for feeding patients, delivering oxygen, and monitoring blood pressure. Don't forget catheters. Intravenous containers, blood bags, sterile packaging, trays and basins, bed pans and bed rails, and thermal blankets. That's just to get you uh, through the maternity ward when you're born in the intensive care unit when you die. My guess is the first material that more and more modern humans feel in their, you know, from the time they pop out, the first material they feel on their body is plastic and quite possibly the very last thing you're going to feel the day you die is plastic. Uh, from cradle to grave, we are swathed in plastic. All right, let's look at steel. <clears throat> Steel's strength, durability, and versa versatility determines the look of modern civilization and enables its most fundamental functions. This is the most widely used metal and it forms countless visible and invisible critical components of modern civilization from skyscrapers to scalpels. Moreover, nearly all other metallic and non-metallic products we use have been extracted, processed, shaped, finished, and distributed with tools and machines made of steel. 
and no mode of today's mass transportation could function without steel. The average car contains, I wish they'd done this, this is Time Magazine, I don't know why all of this is in kilograms, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds. Okay, so the average car contains about 900 kilograms of steel, so we're going to call that a uh, thousand pounds. The average car contains about a thousand pounds of steel and before corona panic struck the world was making nearly 100 million vehicles per year and of course it makes no difference if the vehicle is an electric vehicle or a fossil fueled vehicle. Okay, the, the steel the fossil fuels and the steel and everything else are identical in an electric car or a gas sucking car. All right, do not forget cement. Cement is, of course, the key component of concrete combined with sand, gravel, and water all, you know, all of which are uh, getting harder to find, combined with sand, gravel, and water, cement makes the most massively deployed material. Modern cities are embodiments of concrete, as are bridges. Well, I don't think that bridge in Pakistan is a monument to concrete anymore. What do you guys think? I think we can get rid of that monument to concrete that went down in that flood from that melting glacier in the Himalayas a couple of days ago. Did you see pictures of that big ass bridge uh, getting washed away in that glacial flood? Anyway, uh, <clears throat> modern cities are embodiments of concrete as are bridges, tunnels, roads, dams, runways, and ports. China now produces more than half of the planet's cement, and in recent years, it makes in just two years, China, every two years, makes as much cement as did the United States during the entire 20th century. Like say, you look at the entire 20th century. I mean, you got to throw in Hoover Dam and all the rest, New York City, uh, every bit of cement that the United States used in 100 years, every two years, China alone is, is uh, making that much cement. Yet, another astounding statistic is that the world now consumes in one year. In one year, humanity consumes more cement than it did during the entire first half of the 20th century. And I think the Hoover Dam was built in the first half of the 20th century. <clears throat> and these four materials, so unlike in their properties and qualities, share three common traits. All right, number one, they are not readily replaceable by other materials, certainly not in the near future or on a global scale. Number two, we will need much more of all four of these in the future. And number three, their mass scale production depends heavily on the combustion of fossil fuels, making them major sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, for all you organic farming buffs, including myself, organic fertilizers can not replace synthetic ammonia. Read Vaclav Smeal's lips. I don't care what anybody says, I am with Vaclav and Time Magazine. One more time, 
organic fertilizers cannot replace synthetic ammonia. Their low nitrogen content and their worldwide mass are not enough even if all manures and crop residue were recycled. No other material offers such advantages for many lightweight yet durable uses as plastics. No other metal is a as affordably strong as steel, and no other mass-produced material is as suitable for building strong infrastructure as concrete, which is often reinforced with steel. Yes. <clears throat> as for our future needs, people looking into the crystal ball, high-income countries could reduce their fertilizer use by eating less meat and wasting less, and China and India, the two heavy users, could also reduce their excessive fertilizer applications, which you better believe they're doing this year because of the price of fertilizer. But Africa, we're going to talk about Africa, but Africa, the continent with the fastest growing population, remains deprived of fertilizers even as it is already a substantial food importer. And we're going to see how that plays out when they can't import any food this summer. <clears throat> any hope, any hope for Africa's greater food self-sufficiency rests on the increased use of nitrogen. After all, the continent's recent usage of ammonia has been less than one-third of the European mean. More plastics will be needed for expanding medical, <clears throat> can you say, aging populations and infrastructural, can you say, pipes, uses, and in transportation, see the interior of airplanes and high-speed trains. As is the case with ammonia, steel consumption has to rise in all low-income countries with underdeveloped infrastructures in transportation. And it goes without saying, much more cement will be needed to make concrete, to make concrete. Affluent countries to fix decaying infrastructure in the U.S. all sectors where concrete dominates, including dams, roads, and aviation get a D grade in nationwide engineering assessments. And in low income countries, <clears throat> more concrete will be needed to expand cities, sewers, and transportation. Moreover, the unfolding transition to renewable energies will demand, take a wild guess, huge amounts of steel, concrete, and plastics. No structures are more obvious symbols of, quote, green, green is good. No structures are more obvious symbols of green electricity generation than large wind turbines, but their foundations are reinforced concrete, their towers, nacelles, and rotors are steel, and their massive blades are energy intensive and difficult to recycle plastic resins. And all of these giant parts must be brought to the installation sites by outsized trucks or ships and erected by large steel cranes and turbine gearboxes must be repeatedly lubricated with oil. These turbines would generate truly 
green electricity only if all of these materials were made without any fossil fuels. And uh, what I learned today, guys, right down the street from here at the Amish sawmill, I'm building this deck, and I was looking at this very strange pile of boards. They look like railroad ties. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm using these as the foundation for my deck. And so I asked this Amish dude where these giant, they're like, uh, they look like railroad ties of what you think they were. So I asked the Amish dude, you know, where, what are these things? And he said, well, what, they, they're made out of oak because pine is not strong enough that it has to be hardwood. So what he told me is, you know, they're, they're building all of these giant save the planet wind turbines. So he said, when they bring those giant cranes, those giant fossil fuel powered cranes that Vaclav is talking about, the very first thing they have to do is lay out a, a, like a landing pad for these giant cranes. So they, so they, so you have to add all of this uh, oak lumber. So every one of these windmills, they lay out this big, this big uh, wooden platform, and the crane sits on that. Are you cheering on the uh, the Amish selling me the? Yeah. All right. Anyway, back to Baklov. I had to get off on a on a, that little side note. Okay. The bottom line here. Fossil fuels remain indispensable for producing all of these materials. Without fossil fuels, we would not have we cheer for fossil fuels. We would not have the four uh, foundations of modern civilization. We would not have modern civilization without fossil fuels. And if you think for one minute we're going to get off fossil fuels and still have modern global industrial civilization, think again. Okay, back to ammonia. Ammonia synthesis uses natural gas both as the source of hydrogen and as the source of energy needed to provide high temperature and pressure. Some 85% of all plastics are based on simple molecules derived from natural gas and crude oil, and hydrocarbons also supply energy for their synthesis. Production of primary steel starts with smelting iron ore in blast furnaces in the presence of coke made from coal and with the addition of natural gas and the resulting cast iron is made into steel in large basic oxygen furnaces and cement is produced by heating ground limestone and clay, shale in large kilns, long inclined metal cylinders heated with such low quality fossil fuels as coal dust, petroleum coke, and heavy fuel oil. As a result, global production of these four indispensable materials claims about 17% of the world's annual total energy supply and it generates about 25% of all CO2 emissions originating in the combustion of fossil fuels. The pervasiveness of this dependence and its magnitude make the decarbonization of these four material pillars of modern civilization uncommonly challenging. Replacing fossil fuels in their production will be far more difficult and costly than generating more electricity from renewables, mainly wind and solar conversions. Eventually, new processes will take over, but certainly there are no alternatives that can be deployed immediately to displace large shares of existing global capacities. Their development will 
take time. <clears throat> Synthesis of ammonia and smelting of steel could both be based on hydrogen rather than on natural gas and coke. We know how to do it, but it will take some time before we could produce hundreds of millions of tons of green hydrogen derived from the electrolysis of water by using wind or solar electricity. Virtually all of today's hydrogen is derived from natural gas and coal. The best forecast is that green hydrogen will supply 2% of the world's energy consumption by 2030, far below the hundreds of millions of tons that will eventually be needed to decarbonize ammonia and steel production. In contrast, decarbonization of cement production can only go so far by using waste materials and biomass and new processes have to be developed to be commercialized to make cement CO2 free. Similarly, there is no simple way to decarbonize plastic production and the measures will range from plant feedstocks to more recycling and substitutions by other materials. And beyond these four material pillars, new and highly energy intensive material dependencies are emerging and electric cars are their best example. Okay, a typical lithium car battery, just the battery, uh, for one of these electric cars contains about 11 kilograms of lithium. That is what 25 pounds of lithium, nearly 14 kilograms, we'll call it 30 pounds of cobalt, 27 kilograms of nickel, we'll call that 60 pounds of nickel, more than 40 kilograms of copper, we will call that 100 uh, pounds of copper and 50 kilograms of graphite. So now we're looking at 120, 120 pounds of graphite as well as about 181 kilograms of steel. We're going to call that a little over 400 pounds of steel, aluminum, and plastics. Supplying these materials for one single electric vehicle, one single electric vehicle requires processing about 40 tons of ore, meaning that we need to dig up to, for every electric vehicle to save this planet, 40 tons of the planet will uh, be dug up to go into the med to make one electric vehicle. And given the low concentration of many elements in their ores, it, necessi it actually necessitates extra extracting and processing about 225 tons of raw materials, otherwise known as the planet. So every single electric car you see on the road, 225 tons of the planet were demolished to produce one save the planet electric vehicle. And aggressive electrification of road transport would soon require multiplying these needs by tens of millions of units per year. 225 tons times tens of millions every single year and you wonder why we have only 165 carbon bombs. Alright, coming into the 
bottom of this rant, modern economies will always be tied to massive material flows, whether those of ammonia-based fertilizers to feed our still growing popula global population, plastics, steel, and cement needed for new tools, machines, structures, and infrastructures, or new inputs required to produce solar cells, wind turbines, electric cars, and storage batteries, and until all energies are used to extract and process these materials come from renewable conversions, modern civilization will remain fundamentally dependent on the fossil fuels used in the production of these indisp indispensable materials. No artificial intelligence designs, no apps, no claims or coming dematerialization will change that. And there you go. Thank you, Vaclav Smeal and, uh, and Time Magazine for giving us that hopium-free uh, essay. So what this is, this was adapted from Vaclav Smeal's brand new book, How the World Really Works. How the World Really Works. And if you're wondering how many comments have been received on this story, if, you, if your answer was uh, one comment on the planet and take a guess what it is. This is from Rafiki. Thoughts! Thoughts. Everything Vaclav Smeal just said, Rafiki knows better. Thoughts. Plastics do not need fossil fuels. They come from the same place as fossil fuels. They are more akin to a competing use for hydrocarbons than dependent on them. Steel, same thing. You need coal, but as an input, not a fuel. Yes. I think the article should be titled, These Four Things Need Fossil Fuels Unless We Decide We Don't Want to Use Fossil Fuels to Make Them. We have no thumbs up and three thumbs down to that comment. We now have four thumbs down to that clueless moron. Uh, there you go. One comment. Uh, I was looking at some comment about there was some movie star that I have never heard of. I, some woman, I think she played on some Netflix thing and she's in some sort of legal trouble and uh, I was trying to figure out who this woman was. Never heard of her. 131 comments about some movie star and some legal trouble. One comment about the collapse of a planet. This is why they call it the echo chamber of the doomosphere. Vaclav Smeal I can't believe that Time Magazine gave Vaclav uh, that much press. But good for Vaclav and good for Time Magazine. And uh, so uh, I guess Sandy and Jennifer will be here on Sunday night breaking down the, uh, the cover story. 
so you can find that on environmental coffee on Sunday night but it is a spectacularly gorgeous Thursday sunset and I think when Sandy put the camera down I don't I think you've been looking at my dog all day on this whole rant I don't even think you've been able to see my face not that you care it is a gorgeous sunset time for a margarita with a fossil fuel I wonder how many fossil fuels went into the making of my margarita uh, and the little dog knows the rabbits. The rabbit? The rabbit's waking up or what? Is that a rabbit? You need to go get go get the rabbit like that. Get that rabbit like that. Get out there and then get your rabbit while you still can. Bye guys.